Please welcome to the stage, star of Queer Eye, Karamo Brown. Good morning, friends. Love looking at your beautiful faces this early in the morning. How's everyone doing? Come on, y'all can do better than that. How are you doing this morning? Um, I have to just tell you, I'm very, very, very honored to be here with you all. Um, about six hours ago, maybe a less, less, less than that, about four hours ago, I was actually in New York, and um, I was doing a lot of work and said there is nothing that is going to stop me from being in this room with such amazing people and such amazing leaders. Um, so first of all, give yourself a round of applause for just being here, showing up. Um, before I start, I have to tell you, um, I've never even got to express this to Anise. I don't know if she's still in here. She might have walked out already. But um, is she still in here, Anise? Oh, perfect. So <laughs> when um, you ran for mayor, um, that was a very special moment because I had just relocated back to Houston, Texas, where I was born and raised, to get custody of my biological son, who I didn't know of, and then adopt his younger son. And I was working as a social worker and a psychotherapist, and a lot of people had told me that um, there was this exciting new candidate named Anise, and she's running, and she's a lesbian, and you have to vote. And I was thinking, this is not true. We're in Texas. There's, there's, there's no possible way. I don't know who started this dirty, dirty rumor, but this is not the truth. And then I saw you on the local news station speaking, and I was inspired. And then I went into work where I worked with LGBT, primar LGBT youth primarily, and they were inspired. And then I started having conversations with individuals in communities of color, um, and I saw this shift. People were inspired. They were excited. So I didn't come on when you lost those other elections. I got you when you were on the right election. So, um, but the day that I remember distinctly, the morning that you were elected mayor, and you said earlier that that was a very special day for any politician the day they're elected. But that was also a very special day for me because I remember my sons running in, who were very young at the time, they were probably uh, seven and nine at the time or somewhere around there, and they ran in the room and said, Dad, she won, not fully understanding how dynamic it was, but they were just so excited because they saw a woman, they knew their father was gay, and they saw this woman who identifies a lesbian and part of the community had won and was, was being celebrated. And I just remember having so much pride in that moment and telling my sons that not only did the right candidate win, but the right side of humanity won that morning as well. So, but I also remember the morning that my sons ran into the room just two years ago or so. <laughs> that was a very difficult morning. And with shock and surprise on their face were saying, how could this be? How could this man have won? How? I don't understand. And I could see in their young eyes that they felt traumatized and triggered, and they felt as if there was no hope for their future. Because this person in their minds who had won the presidency and who had selected a vice president, in their minds, they knew at such young ages that this was two individuals that were going to be constantly fighting against people of color, women, LGBT people. And they were scared, like many of us were scared. And that was a very hard moment for me as a father and as a citizen of this great country. And I just remember thinking to myself, how do I explain to my children that they are those people who live at the intersection, their identities are at the intersection of all that this person hates, yet that they are greater than his hate? 
that they are greater than the fears that they have, that they are greater than everything that their mind is telling them that's gonna happen? How do I tell them that? How do I hold them in my arms and tell them that it is going to be okay? Well, I can tell you that as I was getting on the plane to come here, my oldest was getting ready for work and he asked me um, if myself and my fiance were, um, where we are, where we're going. And I told him we were coming to the LGBT Leaders Conference. And I could hear in his voice the hope because he understood that by coming here, there was a room of people who he knew were gonna be fighting for him, for his father, for his aunts, for everything that's right with our country. And it was beautiful to me. You know, my cast and I, we travel around America, we travel overseas, and we see the trauma on people's faces, both LGBTQI, A plus identified, and also our straight allies. We see them scared that their rights are gonna be taken away, that their families are gonna rip, be ripped apart, that they are going to be thrown to the side and forgotten about. I see the trauma every single day as I sit down with them and try to have emotional conversations that help them to heal and to feel better. And what I do every single time is I remind them of rooms like this, but I also remind them of this past election. The rainbow wave, as we've heard Anise say so many times. I remind them that we showed up. But I also tell them not only did we show up, we stepped up. We stepped up to the microphone and told them that it is time that you hear our stories, that you understand who we are, that we will not be silenced anymore. We stepped up to the podium and said, you have to know us, you have to love us, you have to respect us. We stepped up to our communities and said, we know you feel trauma, we know that you feel hurt, we know you feel scared, but we are here to support you and we are going to work together to make sure there is a better tomorrow, not just for us, but for everyone in this country. We stepped up to those who voted against us and said, you might have voted in ignorance, out of fear, but we're not going anywhere. We are not going one single place, so you better learn who I am, respect who I am, and understand that when we work together is when we have a better future, not only for myself and for you, but for our country. But what I realized is that even though we have this amazing rainbow wave, that that's not done. The work that we will be doing today, that we'll be doing after this weekend, is what's most important. It's where we continue to tell people that we will support them, that we will love them, and that we will fight for them. It's where we will walk into those small cities and states that Anise spoke about that my cast and I go into and we will say, we see you, we understand what you're going through, but things will change. We will let all the young LGBTQ plus youth know that your future is brighter, brighter than ever because there are people in office that are fighting for you. But we will also let them know that they have the power to step into office that they have the power to be leaders, to use their voice to create change. We will let them know that they matter, that we matter, that together we are stronger. I grew up in the black church, and so there's something I always like to do. Any of y'all been to a black church before? <laughs> amen. amen. <laughs> I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. we matter. We matter. Neighbor. We matter. we matter, neighbor, neighbor. We, will know we will let them know that we matter. That we matter. Thank you so much, everyone.
Please give a round of applause to the moderator of our breakfast plenary, a new LGBTI World Order, the director of the LGBTI Global Development Partnership at Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice, Carrie Jo Ford Lynn. Good morning. I'm so glad I wore heels today. <laughs> I'm so very happy to be here and following Karamo and Mayor Parker, it's, it's such a pleasure to welcome you this morning to the first breakfast panel. And uh, Estrella has been a longtime partner of the Victory Institute and we have been working together on international programs, building capacity and developing leaders, leadership of LGBTI activists across the globe. Over the last year, we've seen so much progress made, um, you know, especially in the field of research. We've added a lot of research to uh, the field of LGBTI work through the work of Global Philanthropy Project, uh, Estrella, Williams Institute, Victory Institute. And I want to highlight some things that give us hope. In Brazil, over the last decade, We've seen same-sex marriage legalized in 2013. We have trans people who are allowed to use their chosen names on their government IDs. They even have a human rights ministry. And this in the face of rising populism, conservatism, and nationalism, as evidenced by the recent elections. In the EU, EU the standards set at the European Court of Justice, the Euro European um, you know, levels of human rights, they have set standards there that have been important for LGBTI advocates across the globe to draw on for their own work in their own countries and regions. The lived reality is very different for LGBTI communities. And we can see, as evidence from our panel, there is much cause for hope. You know, we have had 54 trans candidates in the last elections. That's a record. <laughs> but a sobering thought as we think about the threats to LGBTI equality is that in 2017, there were also 445 murders of LGBTI people, which represented a 30% increase over 2016. Across the globe, there are serious risks to minorities who stand at intersections of race, ethnicity, religion, se sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, as well as sex characteristics. Today, we are happy to have and honored to have panelists who can speak to these two very distinct realities in both Brazil and the European Union. I'd like to welcome the state legislator for Brazil, the first transgender woman elected to state Congress in Sao Paulo, Erica Malunguinho. I'm particularly happy that Erica is here. She almost didn't make it. I'd also like to welcome member of European Parliament, Terry Reinke. State Legislator in Brazil, Robiance Lima. Yeah. Member of European Parliament, Seb Dance. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm going to start out by asking state legislator Erica Malanguinho for her opening statement. Erica? We have a translator here today, and so she will be doing con concurrent um, translation for both Erica and Ro Beyonce. Bom dia a todos. Bom dia a todos. 
É, meu nome é Erika Malunguinho. Como podem ver, e todo mundo sabe, eu sou uma mulher preta, trans e nordestina. É, nasci no bairro mais preto de Recife, no nordeste do Brasil, num bairro chamado Água Fria, onde foi criado o primeiro terreiro de candomblé, fundado por Ifati Nuké, uma rainha nigeriana que foi para o Brasil na condição de escravizada. Ela fundou um terreiro de Iemanjá Ogunté, a mãe de todos. É lá também onde tem a sede do caboclinho Sete Flechas, onde a cultura indígena encontra a possibilidade de atravessamento na urbanidade. De lá para cá... Good morning to all. My name is Erica Malunguinho. As you can see, I am a black trans woman from the northeast of Brazil. I was born in a very black neighborhood in the city of Recife, in the state of Pernambuco. The neighborhood is called Agua Fria. I was born close to a candomblé, which is a Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian uh, religion uh, church, founded by Ifatima K, a woman who came from, my, from Nigeria as a slave. She then founded a um, cult to honor Yemanja Ogumte and also to honor Caboclinho das Sete Flechas, the man from the countryside with seven arrows. Comecei a minha vida como artista é, durante é, a minha adolescência. É, fiz intervenções performáticas em moda, discutindo gênero, sexualidade e raça. Depois disso, passei muitos anos na área de, da educação, dando aula para crianças, adolescentes e adultos e professores. Passei muitos anos, mais de dez anos, dando aula para professores. E cansada de perceber que as instituições têm um limite para a transformação, é, eu resolvi criar eu mesma um lugar, um território, um espaço de arte, cultura e política radical que realmente enfrentasse as violências estruturais. É aí que surge a Parelha Luzia, é, que hoje é o espaço preto um dos mais importantes do Brasil. I started as an artist and I would um, do a lot of performances. Um, I, from a very early age, I started getting interested in fashion, sexuality and race. And <clears throat> I was also very interested in education. I spent um, some time teaching children, teenagers, adults, and I spent 10 years working with teachers. But eventually, I got very tired, um, and I decided to invest into this radical place at the intersection of art, culture, and politics. Agora vocês sabem quem eu sou. Eu também sei quem vocês são. Now you know who I am, and I also know who you are. É, quantas pessoas negras tem aqui? Aliás, quantas pessoas brancas tem aqui? Levantem a mão. How many white people in the audience? Raise your hand. Eu sei quem vocês são. I know who you are. And English notes. Um, eu queria saber, uh, eu acho que momentos como esses são importantes para decidirmos qual o novo pacto civilizatório, qual o novo pacto de humanidade vamos tecer a partir de agora. I believe events such as this one are important to establish a new civilization pact, a new humanity and humanitarian pact. What is it that we want? 
going here on forward. Porque antes de ser deputada, de ser professora, de ser artista, de ser intelectual, de ser mulher transgênero, eu sou uma pessoa preta antes de qualquer coisa. Because before being a politician, a senator, a teacher, an intellectual, before any of that, I'm a black person. And é. just to wrap it up. Vocês sabem o que é isso? Se não souberem, acho que nós podemos conversar sobre isso. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it means to be black? And if you don't, we can talk about it. Well, all right. Thank you very much, Erica. I'd like to uh, move on to Terry Reintke. And uh, following on what Erica had said, she has a quote and she says, if you want to do something about it, she was referring to several uh, specific movements, you need to speak up and be vocal in these debates. And we'd love to hear your voice. Thank you so much. And first of all, I got to say this. Uh, it's my first time at a conference of the Victory Institute, and I'm so absolutely impressed. And I'm so happy to be here and to see all of you here. We, I mean, in the European Parliament, we're working so hard to um, forward LGBTI rights. But I, I think to see how many people across the globe, the two of you, from all different backgrounds, are working for this, it's giving me already now so much energy. I'm so happy to be here. And I'll try to be short so that we have time for discussion. I have three points that I wanted you to know, that I wanted to bring up in this debate. The first one is, all of the problems that have been mentioned today and yesterday are not problems that are only occurring here in the US or in Brazil with the recent election of the new president. There's something that we see trends all over the globe, also in the European Union. We have our share as well. We see attacks on LGBTI people, we see attacks on minorities, we see attacks on democracy, on the rule of law, on very basic standards of democracy. And I think that actually makes it even more important that we work together and that we stand up for the things that we have, uh, um, that we have succeeded to arrive at in the past, but also to progress the things that we still want to see happen in the future. And that leads me to my second point, because we see these attacks and we see the negative trends. But at the same time, I think we also have to look at the great successes that we have had in the past 10 years. And just to give you a couple of numbers, inside of the European Union, we now have 12 countries that have full marriage equality, something that a while ago would have been unthinkable. I think that's a great success. We have had uh, Malta, a very small country, an island uh, in the Mediterranean, adopt a very, very progressive gender recognition law. We have seen several uh, other gender recognition laws being proposed in other European Union countries, also something that a couple of years ago would have been unthinkable, and I think we should also recognize these successes and celebrate them. And then lastly, and this is also something with the rainbow wave that you have been speaking about, also in Europe, we have seen over the past years a really big rise in LGBTI people candidating for different political positions. Um, we have had um, people from all different backgrounds elected to, to political office, office, which is a, a very, very important thing in order to forward LGBTI rights. But, and this is a third point I wanted to give, all of these successes are currently endangered. We have a very important election next year. In 2019, in May 23rd to 26th, we are electing a new European Parliament. And the European Parliament in the past has always been an institution that has promoted LGBTI rights. The intergroup in the European Parliament that I'm a co-chair of and Sepp Dance, my colleague, is, a, is a, a member of, is the biggest intergroup and it has been absolutely pivotal for promoting LGBTI rights inside of the European Union. But next year, in this very important election, we can either see that we can progress on the things that we have succeeded in the last years or we can see a backlash. And this is why my plea to you is, I know that very often, you know, what is happening back in Europe might not seem so important, but we really need international solidarity next year in order to have a rainbow wave in the European Parliament for the European elections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. And that leads us to state legislator Ro Beyonce Lima, 
who is a lawyer and the first trans lawyer, right, um, to be called to the bar. And she had a quote, you cannot do politics for LGBT people without talking about education, health, security. They are interconnected. And she represents what is possible when we all get together and collaborate. Robiance Lima. Uh, bom dia. Eu sou a Robion Selima, sou advogada, sou a primeira advogada trans no estado de Pernambuco e recentemente eleita co-deputada estadual pela candidatura coletiva das juntas. Good morning. My name is Robion Selima. I'm a lawyer. I'm the first trans lawyer for the state of Pernambuco in the northeast of Brazil. And I'm with a collaborative uh, project called Juntas. Uh, eu sou militante das causas LGBTs e recentemente nós fomos eleitas no mandato coletivo. Eu, como mulher trans, uma bissexual, uma lésbica e outras duas mulheres cisgêneras numa mesma cadeira no parlamento em Pernambuco. Our party has elected me, a trans woman, a bisexual woman, a lesbian woman, and two other cisgender women in the same party in the state of Pernambuco. A ideia principal de uma candidatura coletiva, a ideia principal de um mandato coletivo de, uma, de duas ou mais pessoas ocupando a mesma, a mesma cadeira, o mesmo local de fala no parlamento, é justamente trazer a ideia dessa diversidade, a ideia de muitas pessoas compondo um espaço de tomada de decisão. Né? A gente tem que trazer essa ideia de diversidade é, para a prática, principalmente dentro das questões LGBTs, num país extremamente conservador e com o avanço do neoliberalismo, como o Brasil, né, que teremos um novo presidente, Bolsonaro, que muito provavelmente é, não nos ajudará em nenhuma pauta, em nenhuma força política em relação às causas LGBTs. A whole ideia de ter um coletivo candidate style representation and a collective or group mandate uh, or office in the parliament is precisely that, to um, represent diversity and to represent access to taking decisions. Decisions that are not only LGBT, um, in a country that is still extremely conservative with the rise of neoliberalism, with the recent election of President Jair Bolsonaro, who will not further advance LGBT causes. Ah, então, se torna fundamental que nós, LGBTs, nós, mulheres negras, também ocupamos esses espaços institucionais, espaços de tomada de decisão, porque se a gente não estiver lá, nesse local, outras pessoas vão tomar decisões em nome da gente, outras pessoas vão tomar decisões sobre a vida da gente, que, é, muito provavelmente, não irão nos ajudar em nada. É essencial ter essa representação not only to have LGBT representation, but also to have representation of black women. Because if we do not step forward, others will take that space and will start making decisions about our lives which will not advance our cause. É importante também pensar as causas LGBTs associadas com a questão da negritude, associada com as questões de raça e de classe também, porque a gente não pode trabalhar a política LGBT sem observar a questão de raça e de classe que estão intimamente ligadas. Então, a gente, nós mulheres, eu e Erika Malunguinho, por exemplo, quando a gente entra em espaços institucionais desse tipo, a gente tenta, de alguma forma, reverter a política, a gente traz um novo perfil, uma nova configuração de política para que a política não seja mais apenas branca e cisgênera. E então, é muito importante casar essas questões LGBT com questões de black, issues, 
because we can't dissociate LGBT questions from race, from social class. They're very tightly connected. And so when I, as, as a woman, and Erica Malanginu, when we step into a space, we try and revert years of uh, backwards policies, and we try to implement new politics, which are very different from white and cisgender which is very different from the white and cisgender politics up until now. Uh, nossos corpos negros e trans são políticos, então não há nenhuma outra razão para que esses corpos políticos deixem de ocupar os espaços políticos e institucionais. Our black and trans bodies are political. So there is no reason for these bodies to occupy political spaces. Uh, por fim, eu queria agradecer a oportunidade né, de estar aqui conversando sobre pautas tão importantes com pessoas de diversas regiões do mundo, porque as pautas LGBTs e as pautas também de negritude, de raça e de classe, elas não têm fronteira. And last, I would like to thank you for this opportunity which is so important. It's so important to be here and to experience this diversity with people from all over the world, uh, reminding that LGBT causes and black issues, they know no frontiers. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Robianza is also taking us to church this morning. <laughs> And with that, we're introducing member of European Parliament, Seb Dance, who prior to joining the Parliament, worked with Action Aid UK on poverty, alleviation, and hunger. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to echo the um, comments of my uh, co-panelists and what an honor it is to be here today. Um, and I wanted also to follow up on Terry's plea ahead of the 2019 European elections. I was pounding the streets in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, ahead of the election in uh, 2016, which didn't go well. Um, I was doing my bit for Hillary, uh, and proudly, uh, and, and even though it didn't go our way, please do think about giving your solidarity and support for us uh, for the 28, I'm going to say 28, member states of the European Union, because obviously Brexit is ridiculous and will be stopped. Uh, so, so you have a choice. You have a choice of so many wonderful, beautiful countries to campaign in uh, and to deliver that message that we need uh, progressive LGBTIQ candidates everywhere uh, to be elected. Uh, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the context of where we find ourselves because, as you can see, this is an international phenomenon, what we are facing at the moment. There is a reaction to the changes that we are facing, both in terms of the economy and the societies in which we live in. The technological changes that are occurring are so profound and so encompassing that none of us can really know what their true final impact will be, even if there is a final impact, technology will continue to evolve all the time. And people are very, very frightened. The world of work is changing very, very quickly. Uh, the way in which opportunities for future generations present themselves is changing very, very rapidly. And people are scared. And along come the populists, uh, the guys with the easy answers, the people who say, actually, it's nothing to do with this technological change, it's nothing to do with a revolution in society. It's all about the people who come from over there or over there who have a different skin color or a different religion or a different race or a different sexuality or whatever it is, they are the problem. And that answer to that problem is therefore to stop them coming in. That is the simplistic, uh, easy, uh, solution that people come up with, which of course is nothing uh, like a solution, but it is what unfortunately is the kind of easy, easy step that is all too easy for communities that are facing that change and are fearful of that change, it's all too easy for them to fall under that spell. And what we're seeing in terms of global leadership, of course, is very worrying. 
the Trump administration has withdrawn from a lot of the global compacts that uh, have signaled the progress that we've relied on over many years. And I want to draw an, a comparison between LGBTI representation and the environment. So I am on the Environment Committee in the European Parliament, and it's very clear that on climate change, the Trump administration has taken a step back. So what is the answer? You have to look at leadership from other parts of the world. We have to step up. And I think in the European Union, we have done what we can to try and step up. But ultimately, you're always trying to uh, plug a hole in you, if you like, of what was there before. You're trying to race to catch up with what was there before. But there's something really positive on the margins of all of this. Look at Brazil, look at the US, and look at, indeed, at many of the member states of the European Union, where at a federal and national level, the story is depressing, uh, it's very easy to look at the downsides. Look at what is happening in the cities. Look at what is happening in the regions, uh, in the city regions and the local level. Look at all of you here today, the wonderful candidates that were elected uh, to uh, office in uh, November and who will take up their places in January. Think on that and think of all those networks that are being built. And if we can do this across boundaries, if we can get those city networks working together, this is what we're doing on the environment, it will work for LGBTI rights as well. And we can stop. We can stop uh, this wave against us. And again, the rainbow wave will fight back against the populist wave. And you know what? We will win. I love the optimism. Thank you, Seb. And pivoting from what you were saying about looking at what we can do at the individual level, at the collective level, I'd like to talk with Erica, who started off as an activist and is now the first trans state legislator. And I'd love to hear in the face of increasing fear in the country based on the new president's rhetoric and, and homophobic comments, what are the real opportunities that you see of bringing your activism to the state legislation and the national platform, indeed the international platform as evidenced by your presence here today? Repito, eu sei quem vocês são. I repeat, I will say it again. I know who you are. Eu nasci morta. I was born dead. Mas estou viva, contrariando as estatísticas, contrariando o sistema, contrariando a lógica e o sistema de opressão. But contrary to statistics, to the system, to the oppressive system, I'm alive. O presidente, o presidente que está eleito hoje no Brasil não é muito diferente do que está nos Estados Unidos e não é tão diferente de como as articulações é, se organizam em torno, inclusive, da nossa comunidade LGBT porque é um, são articulações que, acima de tudo, são brancas e de homens cisgênero, mesmo dentro da comunidade LGBT. The elected president in Brazil is not that different from the president here in the United States. And even some of the networks even some of the LGBT networks, um, there are some that are white and cisgender. Quanto de Bolsonaro ou quanto de Trump habita em nós? How much of Bolsonaro and how much of Trump lives within us? Essa é uma grande pergunta, porque a presença de pessoas como Trump ou Bolsonaro significa a naturalização do apagamento dos corpos negros, a naturalização do apagamento dos corpos LGBTs, a naturalização do apagamento dos corpos de mulheres. É, o imaginário que faz com que Trump ou Bolsonaro estejam no poder é a naturalização da nossa ausência. E quantos de nós estão naturalizando as presenças negras? Quando eu perguntei quantas pessoas brancas tem aqui, é exatamente para a gente pensar onde estão as pessoas pretas. And so, the big question here, whether we're talking about Trump or Bolsonaro in Brazil, 
is the naturalization, which means making it something natural of black bodies, LGBT bodies, women's bodies. And so within this very fluid imaginary space, there, we don't see those, those presences a lot. When I asked you how many of you are white, it was precisely so that we could start seeing where the black people are. Mas eu não vim aqui falar sobre dor, não vim aqui falar sobre essas coisas que violentam meu corpo, porque todo mundo já sabe. O que eu vim fazer aqui é efetivamente é, selar um novo marco civilizatório, um novo marco humanitário. É, quero aqui acordar com vocês quantos de nós estamos dispostas a entender as estruturas de opressão para dentro de nossas casas, das nossas instituições, enfim, dos lugares que, que habitamos. Porque se por aqui as coisas estão difíceis ou não vão do jeito que deveria ir, imaginem na institucionalidade. Eu quero saber e eu quero fazer um acordo com vocês, porque o nome disso é microfísica do poder. I'm not here to talk about my pain. I'm not here to talk about how my body has been assaulted. I am here to establish, to seal a new time, a, civil, a civilization and a new humanita humanitarian pact. I want to wake up with you here and I want to see how many of us are willing to talk about issues within our houses, within our institutions. Because if things are hard here, believe me, they're also harder in other places. The, the name of what I want to do is a, an agreement, for, a micro-agreement for power. Thank you. I, I think that I would love to like hear from Terry speaking about funding and, and power. Um, as, I, I, as I note that the European governments are decreasing funding to LGBTI issues globally, and you mentioned you know, various ways that uh, the European Parliament are working on LGBTI rights through the intergroup and the elections that are coming up next year. Can you speak about like ways in which you are engaging, the European Parliament is engaging various communities, including civil society, mm -hmm. to address some of the LGBTI issues that are, that are arising? Well, I think that the challenge that we are facing or that we have been facing in the past years, especially with Trump being elected US president, but also with some other global trends um, that we have seen was that uh, what we were fighting for in the European Parliament was for the European Union to kind of fill that space and to say we are counterbalancing this movement because we are committed to fundamental rights, we are committed to democracy and so on and so on. And what we have seen is that, yes, in terms of funding, in terms of certain initiatives that have been taken, there have been movements, but I think on the grand political scale, in terms of um, having a foreign policy that focuses on values, that focuses on fundamental rights, that, you know, in, when we look at human rights versus economic interests, that at least puts it on the same level, I think we still have a lot of pressure to put that the European Union as a whole, meaning also the European Commission and especially the, the member states, to take that role, because I think that they haven't done this, at least to the extent that I would like to see it. And I mean, we're talking about Trump, we're talking about uh, Bolsonaro, but when we look at uh, Putin, when we look at Erdogan, um, there are other global forces where I'm actually even more um, skeptical that, well, not skeptical that they would do something for LGBTI rights, but I'm really sure that they are going to, to fight against promoting LGBTI rights. So I think it's absolutely crucial to make this a topic in the European elections next year and for the voters to very clearly state that we, in terms of funding, in terms of legislation, but also in terms of having a role of global leadership on fundamental rights, on LGBTI rights, we demand something from the European Union. 
Thank you, Terry. And, and speaking about like working in concert in order to make voices heard, Ro Beyonce, you, you know, through your collaborative, you are able to get out the vote and really be able to uh, represent, you know, this minority, min minorities in your community and uh, win your election. Can you speak about the larger importance of further collaborating, especially within the government that you're now a part of, in order to advance LGBTI issues in the face of rising right-wing ideology? É, a gente vive num contexto político em que as mulheres são sistematicamente excluídas da política. Não é dado às mulheres um lugar de fala, não é dado às mulheres um local institucional de tomada de decisão, especialmente às mulheres LGBTs e negras. We face a current political context in which women have been excluded. So women do not have an opportunity to speak. Um, women do not have uh, an institutional presence, especially LGBT and black women. Um. O projeto de mandato coletivo da Junta surge de uma insatisfação coletiva de cinco mulheres que nunca se sentiram representadas no sistema político posto atualmente. A junção dessas cinco mulheres tem, teria a possibilidade de que fosse melhor e mais possível que a gente ocupasse esse espaço institucional de tomada de decisão que sempre nos foi negado durante toda a história. Our collective project comes from the dissatisfaction of five women who never really felt represented, never really felt that they belonged to an institutional space. And so our idea was to improve our representation, improve our positioning. Somos cinco mulheres negras LGBTs que ocupam um espaço institucional que sempre nos foi renegado. O fato de a gente apenas estar lá no parlamento pernambucano já representa por si só um fato político, uma demarcação histórica extremamente importante. We're five black LGBT women. And the fact that we now occupy this political institution, this, we have access to the parliament in the state of Pernambuco, that is a huge leap. That's a historical feat. E o nosso primeiro desafio é justamente trazer uma nova configuração dessa política, né? desconfigurar esse formato político que é branco, que é cisgênero e que é feito, na maioria das vezes, pelos homens. Our first challenge is, therefore, to give new shape to this political configuration, which is white, male, cisgender. A gente traz um novo formato de fazer política no sentido também de mostrar às pessoas que a gente ocupar esses espaços também é possível. We also bring a new format of doing politics so that we can show people that it is possible. Se você é mulher, se você é mulher trans, se você é mulher trans negra, é possível sim você ocupar um espaço institucional, é possível sim você ser eleita deputada, governadora ou até mesmo presidenta da república. If you're a woman, if you're a trans woman, if you're a black trans woman, it is possible. It is indeed very possible for you to be mayor President, Senator, even, even President. Amen. Thank you so much, Real Beyonce. And I think my final question before I open it up for uh, general questions from the audience is for Seb. When you have the platform that you do, how do you ensure that 
the various intersections of vulnerability between race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, as well as issues that impact the climate, impact all of us. How do you ensure that these get the platform that they need and how are you engaging with civil society who are on the ground doing the work in order to move these issues forward, especially facing an election? Well, I, that, that intersectionality is, is key, isn't it? And, uh, you know, the, the, there's a sort of tendency to forget that actually when you take action on one issue, you, you, you get more effectiveness when you uh, scale it up. Climate is a very good example. When you look at the correlation, for example, between poor air quality and climate action, if you take action on one of them, uh, you tend to get better results on the other as well. And that's why uh, it's, it's so crucial that we have people elected into positions of influence and power who get that intersectionality and understand why it's so important that uh, the fight for equality, whether you're uh, LGBT uh, or, or whether or not uh, you are fighting for uh, the rights of black women or black trans women or uh, any uh, minority who are being oppressed or indeed are facing this backlash that I was talking about in terms of uh, the populist uh, easy way out, if you like, uh, wave that we face. It's so important that that um, acknowledgement uh, comes from, from uh, people who are elected. But the really key thing, I think, and this is why I talk about the city networks and getting, getting it right at a local level, the really key thing is having the institutions in place uh, and the frameworks in place to be able to continue to deliver even when the political context at a national level uh, goes the wrong way. Because if you have, and this is why, and I'm sorry to talk about the wretched Brexit again, uh, it's never far from my consciousness, but the reason that the people who sold that, I'm, I'm not going to use rude words, uh, particular policy, the reason that they sold that is because they know that their agenda is being held back by the institutions that are in place at a European level. They know, they know that a future... A future British government, for example, could not ride roughshod over the uh, Convention on Human Rights. They know, for example, that they will be held back legally by the uh, levels of protection that are enshrined in European law. And that's why it's so important that we fight against that. But it's, you know, that's, the, that's the reason we need strong institutions at a UN level. It's, it's why we need more cooperation regionally and internationally. Because if you get that network in place... They can't break it up easily. They can't break it up easily. Because even when you have a president like you have here, you have amazing mayors, you have amazing governors, you have amazing state representatives who can keep going and who can enact progressive policies. And that's because they've got the institutions there in place. Thank you. So we've heard the importance of representation, the importance of collaboration, and the importance of not really leaving it to the absolute head. We all have responsibilities at all levels in order to move uh, LGBTI issues and other intersectional issues forward. I'd like to open it up. We have time for maybe one or two questions. And so if you're able to keep them really concise, we would love that before we get on to the next session. Bom dia, soy de Georgia, soy preta y eleita y queer. Para todas no palco, quais eventos podemos participar en su país para apoyar? I wanted to say I'm elected, I'm queer, I'm black, um, I'm from Georgia. Where can we come? What events can we attend to support you in your countries? Shall we, sh uh, shall we take another question and, um, and ask them all together? Yes, one more question. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Luca. I'm Brazilian American, so I'll just do this in Portuguese and then I'll translate. Uh, muito obrigado por vocês terem vindo. É um, uma das coisas mais inspiradoras que eu já vi é ver vocês aqui. Eu estou muito, muito feliz de ter vocês aqui. É, eu queria que vocês. Eu acho que os Estados Unidos têm tanto a aprender com o Brasil. É, e eu queria muito que se vocês pudessem contar um pouco mais do que é esse mandato coletivo. Eu acho que é, as pessoas não entenderam muito bem é, o fato de que vocês estão para uma é, um, uma uma cadeira, né? mas com várias pessoas, e como isso é empoderador e, e pode ser um modelo para cá também. Então, obrigado. Um, I was asking them to... Um, I was saying how much I am inspired, but I was asking them to please talk about um, the idea they have a collective mandate, so that means they have one seat with five people occupying it, and I think that's an amazing model that the U.S. can learn from, so I was asking them to talk yeah. more about it. <laughs> So it sounds like the first question we could have Erica answer and the second one, Robiance. Yeah. Um, 
And we have just a few minutes. É, eu, eu acredito que a comunidade global tem uma responsabilidade muito grande pela frente, é, que diz respeito a território, que diz respeito, diz respeito a como as dinâmicas geográficas foram organizadas de modo a revalidar as estruturas de opressão. I believe the global community has a tremendous responsibility ahead. And these responsibilities pertain to territories, geographical dynamics, to validate all the structures that have collaborated to oppression. Precisamos lembrar é, que o projeto de mundo que temos hoje em curso ele, é, ele foi construído, idealizado pelo Ocidente, pela Europa, pelas pessoas brancas, pelo sistema né, que se chama branquitude, e que hoje o que temos como resultado em termos de civilização é o resultado da lógica de poder hegemônica das pessoas brancas. We need to remember that our plan for the world, our project for the world, that we have in place right now is something that was conceptualized by the West, by Europe, by a white system, by whiteness. And so this has resulted in a uh, civilization that has been uh, hegemonous. Cabe agora entendermos e pensarmos é, quem somos nós neste tempo. Quem são essas pessoas que estão agindo neste agora? Entender que a humanidade que me é roubada a todo momento, ela está em reintegração. O eu estar na Assembleia Legislativa hoje não, não é nada demais. Para mim não significa nada, nada de assombroso, de diferente. Eu estou retomando a um lugar de uma história que foi interrompida. E minha grande questão... É, em relação a isso, estamos todos cientes dessa história? Estamos cientes que a humanidade das pessoas pretas diz respeito a elas serem pretas, LGBTs, delas serem africanas, delas serem imigrantes, delas serem, enfim, terem inúmeras subjetividades? Porque, ao que me parece, é, às vezes é, a gente fala comunidade LGBT e população negra como se fosse a mesma coisa. Não, são coisas diferentes. A comunidade negra tem inúmeros, inúmeras marcas e inúmeras subjetividades que nunca são colocadas em pauta, porque, afinal de contas, é, tudo é colocado é, abaixo desse guarda-chuva que, às vezes, é enganoso, chamado diversidade. Eu não, sou, não faço parte do balaio da diversidade. Meu povo, minha raça, é fundamento, é lei. And I think after this translation, we'll have to ask uh, the other question to be answered in person so we can move on. And so now it's important to understand and to think who I am, who we are. Me, I'm part of humanity. I'm part of the collective. For me to have a seat in the legislature, it's not a big deal. This is merely history that was interrupted. Sometimes we talk about black communities, LGBT communities, immigrant communities, but it's not the same thing. There's so much subjectiveness, there's so much subjectivity within the black communities. It's, it, it's not, it can't all go under that fake umbrella of diversity. My commitment is with my people. My commitment is with that which is essential, that which is the law. I think that's a great note to end, wrap this panel up. Um, thank you so much to Seb, Terry, you had...
just super briefly, because you, answer, you asked the questions about what you can do. Follow the intergroup on Twitter. Try to find one queer candidate that is running for the European Parliament next year. Get in contact with them. See how you can support them. If you can, come to Europe, even if you cannot vote in the European elections. I think we are far beyond the point that we should think that we cannot get involved in debates when we cannot vote in a specific country. Do get involved in the debate. Fight. F Sorry? Stuff envelopes, <laughs> uh, use Twitter, use Facebook, use whatever networks you want to use. Really get involved in this debate. There is a lot at stake next year in, in, next year in Europe. And I think we need to really have everybody on board from Brazil, from the US, from wherever you're from, really be part of this discussion and grab some of these wonderful rainbow shoelaces that we have made as the intergroup to remind you of that and wear them. And I think, like Seb said, we are, in the end, we are stronger, we are more beautiful, and I think we can win this. So please get involved in the European election campaign next year. Such amazing points of hope. Thank you all. And I'm looking forward to the next session, which is on marijuana. I'm from Jamaica, so I'm a little invested. Um, thank you, Seb, Terry, Erica, and Ro Beyonce, and thank you all.